Hello, one and all. Harry Durham here, host of the 20 is Plenty podcast. Uh, please ignore the really old, ancient and ugly chandelier that I've got going on just above my head. All I need you to do is make sure you like and subscribe to 20 is Plenty just down below for more exclusive content coming every single week. He, he actually came in, I think when he first started <laughs> dating Meghan Markle and it was, it was just when it had all come out and he came in yeah. the after the game and um and we had won so the boys are happy and and he's happy and the boys are kind of giving him a little a little nudge i think it was when suits was on and all that kind of stuff chris tell me come on you've you've packed out twickenham eighty thousand. you've played all over the world is beating the royals the most nerve-wracking experience you can go through <laughs> you know you know what it actually is i mean you look a bit like prince harry it's the ginger beard my my well no disrespect to prince harry my uh my uh ball patch isn't coming through just yet so <laughs> some highlights in there as well <laughs> uh, but you know what it, it was like Har harry actually i remember so he was when i was involved he, he loves his rugby um and he would come in every now and then into camp into Penny Hill Park where we're training, we would always know something was happening because there'd be a lot of Range Rovers coming around, like mm. like that. There's a lot of people who could probably kill you very easily, but they look like a normal person <laughs> and just kind of scoping out. And then Stuart or already at the time would say, "Oh, by the way, we've got a special guests coming in." And then Harry would come and he'd mix around and he loved it. And I, I, remember, I, can't, I can't remember who we played, but we lost uh, our first game in the Six Nations one year. And we were having a, uh, and when, whenever you lose any game in the Six Nations, let alone the first, because you you want that grand slam, and then you're yeah. very much back against the wall. You're thinking, okay, how can we get ourselves back into the competition? Because you've already got one foot behind everyone else now, or especially mm. the team who'd won their games. And it was myself, Stuart, the top coaches in with England at Farrells and Roundtree, and um, the other top players as well in terms of the leadership group with. Um, Owen Fowler and Brad Barrett, um, Jeff Parley, I think, was in there. And we were having this kind of crisis meeting. It was this crunch talk meeting. <laughs> and Prince Harry was just kind of sat there, like in the group, in like this very behind the scenes, in a in the Penny Hill Park changing room, just us, no cameras, no nothing. Really? About what went wrong? How do we get ourselves back into the competition? And mm. it was like, <laughs> we just sat in this this kind of circle having a very honest chat and debate and tactic meeting and, and yeah Harry was just kind of sat there and mm. I, can't, I, I think he did actually actually uh, contribute to the meeting oh really uh, I mean I, I can't remember what he said but it was just one of those really surreal moments I mean playing for your mm. country is surreal in itself and it's such an honour but then when you have this meeting and Harry's just sat there um, it was it was pretty incredible and look, I, I love the Royals I think they're brilliant um and yeah, to go to Buckingham Palace and meet the meet the late Queen, unfortunately. Um, I always say that is the best person I've ever met. And I've been lucky really? to meet some pretty incredible people. And like you said, that was probably the most nervous I've ever been meeting a, a famous or well-known person. Uh, but she, yeah, she was lovely. And then Prince Philip behind um, probably gave you a little bit more. Um, yeah. He gave you a little bit more. And, and actually, after the World Cup, because that's when we met them, he actually wrote me a letter, uh, which I have in kind of my memorabilia kind of box. Mm. Uh, and just basically said, kind of, keep your head up, all that kind of stuff. Because he he enjoyed his rugby and a lot of them enjoyed their rugby. Um, and yeah, it was a, an incredible honour. So uh, I've seen the picture of you at Buckingham Palace shaking the Queen's hand. And she was known for her humour and her wit. Did she, because obviously you were England captain, what was the message that she gave you when you met her face to face? I mean, in all, in all honesty, she was she was pretty quiet. Uh, really, she, um, like before she comes in, you get someone explaining you. Okay, you you bow like this. You put your hand out. If she puts her hand out, you you kind of make eye contact, all that kind of stuff. And it's 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 a bit of pleasantries, really. Um, but yeah, she, she was she was lovely. Um, she she was very nice. But like I said, Philip behind was knew probably a little bit more about the rugby. Mm. Uh, and being Philip in his Philip way uh, was a bit more out there, I would say. Um, 
I always Sorry. wondered this as well. Um, of course, because uh, Mike Tyndall is in the uh, royal family. Um, do you have to treat him differently or not? <laughs> I mean, I think he's got some good stories about because, of course, he's had Christmas and stuff there and 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 all that kind of stuff. So he's uh, for him. I think uh, wasn't it Princess Anne who obviously his his mother in law told him to go get his nose fixed because it was kind yeah. of over there. <laughs> It looks uh, great as well. I know he does. I mean, he is. He's come a long way. But he's a, he's a great guy. He's one of those very charismatic guys, very charming guy. And yeah, he's um, obviously he's got his podcast and stuff. And he's mm. I think he made numerous jokes about his royal kind of heritage now and his status and how he waves a certain way. And, <laughs> um, but no, yeah, like I said, they've all and they've all been big rugby fans. I think I think Kate Middleton is now the the patron of the RFU. Mm. Uh, um, but, but yeah, so yeah, it was always an interesting time, like you said, just having Harry knocking about training. He he wouldn't get involved in training, but he'd be around <laughs> and chat to the guys <laughs> off there and um, interact and stuff like that. Uh, and I remember, who was it? He, he actually came in, I think when he first started <laughs> dating Meghan Markle and it was, it was just when it had all come out and he came in yeah. and him after the game and... Um, and we had won, so the boys are happy, and and he's happy, and the boys are kind of giving him a little a little nudge. I think it was when Suits was on and all that kind of stuff. Wow. I think it was a leak to the press or something. Um, so yeah, again, and he, like I said, he, he's great. He's a great guy. Whenever I've had that opportunity, um, yeah, he's been fully supportive of of the England side. Chris, so I've uh, had a few listeners get in touch, and uh, they want to they want to ask you some questions. If that's all right. I have Jacko in Peterborough. Uh wants to know how bad you felt when legendary ref Nigel Owens told you off during <laughs> a match in the 2000, 2015 Six Nations between England and France. He called you Christopher as well. Um yeah. do you think he definitely put you in your place then? <laughs> you know, you know what? That's <laughs> every time England play France in any rugby game, that always comes up because that was really? the game. Um and I you know what? It wasn't until I got it, got in and got on my phone later that evening that I realised what had happened. Because I mm. think I, I didn't clock it, but I think just subconsciously in the game, whether it had been years and years of my mum kind of telling me off in that kind of way, it was just an an, an instant reaction. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've I've had a fair amount of stick from that, and I've actually <laughs> I did a podcast with Nigel, and and we've actually. We've crossed paths over the LGBT community and stuff like that in the past. Um, and I actually presented him with his his award that night. Um, so, yeah, like we we probably bonded over it. <laughs> but at the time, yeah, it definitely ate at me a little bit, I think. And I said, look, one day we'll, we'll definitely share a beer. And I, I said to him, I was like, was it like a bet with you and your mates in a pub, the way they kind <laughs> of said Because some of the players, you have kind of these things saying, okay, media today, you have to say... I don't know this weird saying or get get some sort of elephant or something into mm. into into your what you want to put out there. Just <laughs> because it becomes the same thing again and again and again. And as journalists say, you're bored, you get bored, and you want to have a bit of fun. And I was like, did someone put you up to? And he just said, no. It just I mean, look, he's a funny guy. He's a very quick witted guy, um, and he claims it just came out. Charles and Ellsbury, uh, how shook. And inexperienced did you feel when you were announced as England captain despite making only one appearance? Yeah, hugely. Hugely, to be honest. It was, uh, like I said, going into a Six Nations as well. I'd never played in the Six Nations. Um, only captain of England once. And that was two years beforehand. Um, so there was a massive change. I was captain in Harlequins at the time. So, of course, I had experience in that. Um and I think with any captain, any type of leadership, it's surrounding yourself with good people. And I think when anyone sees a captain and they only see one person, but no good or great captain has ever been that without the good and great people around them, mm. team around them and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's why I always think it's hugely important and what I did early on. But I remember that I was named captain and then we went out to train. Um, and then I spoke to the team in the huddle and I think in my head I'd been building this kind of moment up and I, spoke, I, I probably said a load of rubbish, to be honest, but it didn't matter. <laughs> and then as I left that huddle, Andy Fowler, who was our coach at the time, or one of our coaches, 
uh, who captained Great Britain, I think, at the age of 18 or 20, so very young as well. And he said, look, now relax. You've done that first bit. You've got it out of the way. You've built that one moment up in your head. Mm. And now just, just be you. Be you to the best of your ability and do what you do. 